From the Watchbox Studios, this is On Point on Watchbox with Cynthia Hardy. Good morning. Welcome to On Point on Watchbox. It's always a pleasure to bring you our show each and every week. And please take the opportunity to tune into the radio show tonight. On Point with Cynthia Hardy is heard every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. on 101.3. That's on the Big DM. This week on the TV show, On Point on Watch, exposing elder abuse, the dark side of caregiving. Elder abuse is a rapidly growing national and international problem. It includes physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, exploitation, neglect, and abandonment. The Department of Justice estimates that one in 10 people over 60 is a victim of elder abuse. One in 10 people over 60. That's almost 6 million cases a year, sadly. The majority of elder abuse is committed by victims' family members, as well as staff at nursing homes, assisted living, and other facilities. A couple of recent South Carolina cases make the point. You remember in Greenville, Carol Beam Howe and her son David are charged in the death of an 82-year-old relative who authorities say died after she sat in the same chair for six months, unable to move on her own. Well, here in the Midlands, a 59-year-old caregiver is said to have been caught on surveillance abusing an in an incapacitated 91-year-old in her care. Well, what we do know is that something has to be done, so this week we are looking at the issue of elder abuse, the dark side of caregiving. And this is one of those topics, uh, Brian, that we really don't look forward to covering because no, it really has not. a very sad undertone. It does. It's, it's almost unthinkable, some of the things that you mentioned just now, but they happen. Mm -hmm. They happen. And at some point, none of us want to think about this either, but at some point, some of us are going to need some type of care. You and I probably will. People in my family, uh, older relatives, mm -hmm. have, have been in the care of others, whether mm -hmm. it be in a facility or Absolutely. whether they've had someone visit their, in their home. And you want to make sure they're being treated like they should be. Absolutely. You know, uh, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Uh, Maisie Smith is able to be with us today, and so is Brenda Stalzer. Uh, and the reason I'm glad you all are, this is one of those topics that's very difficult to talk about, but you kind of immerse yourself in it every day. You're at the Arnold School of Public Health over at the University of South Carolina, and mm -hmm. this is something that you don't just deal with from a research standpoint. You're actually out there in the community looking at cases, Absolutely. and I guess it can I guess it's, it's really um, something that a lot of people don't like to talk about because it's hard to witness, but we must deal with it. Absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned the statistics, the six million cases that you mentioned, there's actually thousands, if not millions more, due to the underreporting of elder abuse. We have to consider the elders, they're a part of the silent generation and they don't report abuse as much as they should and we typically relate that to fear. Mm -hmm. You mentioned family members. The National Center on Elder Abuse reports that 90% of those cases are at the hands of family members. The most common type of abuse is financial exploitation. And so we look at those numbers. Not only does elder abuse affect those numbers, but it also affects the service delivery system as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Me being a licensed social worker and gerontologist, if I know that someone is being abused, I can't feasibly leave them in that situation. I got you. And so now that person runs the risk of being displaced from their home, from their family, and from their loved ones. And you mentioned nursing home placements. That's one of the placements where we tend to house the individuals while an investigation is going on, maybe mm -hmm. short term, maybe long term, also assisted living. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the, not only the physical consequence of abuse, but we have to look at emotional. When our elders transition in those types of environments, they tend to not do well. Increased rates of depression. Mm -hmm. So depression can be treated so it can affect the, the medical system and mm -hmm. increase health care. So when we can't really look at elder abuse in a vacuum, because it's a snowball effect, mm -hmm. it affects the person's quality of life, it affects the service delivery system, and it can increase health care costs. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, one of the things I know Brenda does is uh, work with a guardian ad litem program mm -hmm. so that when the state finds those individuals that Dr. Smith talked about uh, that may be so vulnerable and maybe being abused by family members and their uh, surroundings, the state has to to take um, to take over those situations, and they've got cases like that in South Carolina. It's it's hard to think about. It's, I know it's got to be hard for both of you to to deal with situations like this. But that's what these programs are for to step in and to help. Right, right. And what we do is we recruit and train volunteers to serve as guardians ad litem across the state. 
and our guardian ad litem to represent the best interest of vulnerable adults who've been taken into custody by Department of Social Services because they've been abused, neglected, or exploited. You know, like um, I keep saying, it's hard to talk about, but it's harder to even fathom, you know? Right. You see it. What effect does that have on you? We see, well, we're in the role where we see it, but we also get to do something about it. So it's, it's that's very, um, it, it's, it's very meaningful for us and for our volunteers. That's a good point that Brenda makes. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. You know, being a social worker and, and having your heart into it, when we look at those caregivers, whether they're professional, non-professional caregivers, they don't have the passion to care for someone else. The quality of care that they provide is going to be affected. We look at some of the statistics, and the statistics show that individuals, elders with dementia are at higher risk for elder abuse and it's because of their challenging cognitive nature and those challenging behaviors that they display and caregivers are not well equipped to deal with those behaviors and so they tend to maybe use medication to control those medica to control those behaviors but if you don't understand the trajectory of the disease and how it impairs a person's ability to think properly and make good decisions then those behaviors are going to be challenging mm -hmm. and so when they're using medications to uh, settle the person or it could be sedating it puts that person at higher risk for falls and further injury which could land them into the hospital you know understanding uh, the whole myriad of issues that impact uh, elderly people is very important when you're working with them because I, I was just thinking as you were saying that uh, they're vulnerable just by virtue of age and just by virtue of the fact that their bodies are weaker than they have you than they have been in the in the past and so you have to incorporate all of that when you talk about taking care of them and keeping them free from harm mm -hmm. right. we're gonna go to break when we come back I do want us to um, look at our growing number of elders in mm -hmm. our state uh, our state, Brian, has about four and a half million people. We've got close to a million people who are 60 and over. And we'll talk when we come back about what changes that mean are on the horizon for South Carolina. Stay tuned. From the Watchbox Studios, this is On Point on Watchbox with Cynthia Hardy. Welcome back to On Point on Watch Fox, our show today, Elder Abuse, and it's the dark side of caregiving. Um, we have had a couple of recent incidents in our state where yeah. it's been brought to our attention that, you know, uh, that's a very vulnerable population that is prone, unfortunately, to be preyed upon by people who don't have the most honorable intentions. Yeah. Yeah. And as we, we heard in, in the first segment, some of these uh, cases are not reported. So there, there may be, unfortunately, more instances of this coming up. Absolutely. Now, we got going down in a certain direction before we went to break, and it got us a question in my mind about this. Are there certain health conditions that, as the population uh, ages, that are more difficult for a caregiver uh -huh. to understand, to Absolutely. deal with, that could lead to something bad happening. Absolutely. When we look at the numbers of our aging population, approximately a thousand Americans are turning 65 years of age every day with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia being on the rise. That's one of the conditions that is more challenging for caregivers because there's no change in the trajectory of the disease and because of signs and symptoms may lead to challenging behaviors mm -hmm. caregivers don't understand how to manage those behaviors and they tend to go to medication first but there are a lot of non-pharmacological strategies that can be tried such as in the environment and the way you communicate and because they don't know they simply give up I see right. do you see that as well Brenda? right I see that and and it's really important yeah, for caregivers to know about the resources that are out there Absolutely. to help them because we do we do have cases where people have taken care of someone they love them very much and they've tried very hard but they get to the point where they can't do it anymore maybe the person has dementia and they're wandering all the time and the person has to work they just can't they've reached their wits end and they might drop them off at the hospital and say I, I'm not gonna pick oh, them up really and then and then the person gets taken into custody um, well, once we get involved and DSS gets involved we can work with the family and sometimes we are able to set up the resources to help that person go back with the family because the family really does want to help the person and care for the for the person do you see those numbers yeah. increasing um, I've seen several cases like mm -hmm. that lately. 
I guess yeah. what I'm wondering is, uh, in the state of South Carolina, this was interesting to me, Brian, I didn't know it, just like there's a population of foster care children that is that vulnerable population of kids that doesn't really have a caretaker uh, besides the state uh, to see after their needs, there's a certain population of elderly people that are like that as well. And uh, that's, a, that's something that escaped me uh, until doing the research for this story. And I, and I think that a, a number of times people don't realize that. Right, mm. absolutely. And there are residential facilities for individuals with cognitive impairment or vulnerable adults. Um, there are adults, so they still have the capacity to make their own decisions if they have challenges making those decisions, and there are advocates and support teams available for them. Um, but, you know, in that, we have to educate the folks that we invest our most vulnerable populations to. You talked about staff at nursing homes and assisted livings. In order for them to provide proper care to an aging population, say with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, we have to give them the effective tools they need to provide that quality That's of care. That's right, Dr. Smith. Without that, the quality of care will be at risk and it will increase the rate of abuse, whether it's intentional or unintentional. So we all have a responsibility here. Uh, if I'm, let's just say I'm a person who has a an older relative, a parent, a, a, a grandmother that we're caring for, and I'm, I'm the one that's responsible for that care. W what are some of the resources out there that are available to the, just the common person about things they need to know about how to more effectively cope with certain situations? All right, that's an excellent question. When we talk about our elderly population, we have the Lieutenant Governor's Office on Aging and the Area Agencies on Aging that are throughout the state of South Carolina, mm -hmm. and it, they're everything aging. Mm -hmm. You know, the South Carolina Department of Health and Human Services has the Community Long-Term Care Waiver. The South Carolina Department of Health and um, Department of Disabilities and Special Needs, they also have various waivers. Um, there's the Healthy Connections Prime Program mm. that is the, the coordinated care entity that pulls together all Medicaid and Medicare resources oh, really? for someone who's 65 years or older. What's the name and of that program again? Healthy Connections Prime. They have one professional there. That's under Health and Human Services. That's under Health and mm -hmm. Human Services. Mm -hmm. And that one person, that one professional, facilitates all the services for that member so that person and their family won't have to navigate the healthcare system, which can be very convoluted at times. So you have that one professional that's well-versed that can pull together all those resources to have a better streamline um, form of service for that individual. Yes, good, because a lot of times people don't know where to go for resources and starting right there with those agencies is the best place right, to yeah. start. I think right. starting with the Area Agency on Aging, that, that's mm -hmm. a good place to start. We're going to go um, to break. We're going to come back, have a longer segment to wrap up with. I want you all to think about things that you want to make sure we leave our audience with. The biggest thing, we need to tell people how to report. Absolutely. And I also want to talk about situations that I've seen where I know people are financially taking advantage of older people. And uh, we've got to talk about that and tell people what to look for. You guys, we're talking elder abuse the uh, dark side of caregiving and we're getting answers with uh, Brenda St tell me your last name Brenda Stalzer Brenda Stalzer and Dr. Macy Smith we'll be right back you guys <laughs> From the Watchbox Studios this is on point on Watchbox with Cynthia Hardy Welcome back to On Point on Watchbox, our topic today, elder abuse, the dark side of caregiving. Brian McConkey and I have been sitting here talking to Dr. Macy Smith and to uh, Brenda Stolzer. Right. Stolzer. All right. You got it. We uh, yeah. are, um, uh, this is our last segment that we're devoting to this topic, but it's so important that we want to make sure we get a lot of things in. And Brian, uh, Brenda won't let us start the segment unless we talk about volunteers, <laughs> right? Right. We, <laughs> okay. We are a statewide program and we recruit volunteers across the state. We have a training coming up in Columbia next Friday, the February 5th, and mm -hmm. on February 19th we have a training coming up in the upstate. Okay. So if, if anyone is interested in volunteering, they can call me. Um, my number is 803-445-5953, and we would love to have them, and we work very closely with our volunteers, so it's not um, our volunteers do go to court, they represent the best interests of vulnerable adults, but we're, we're right there with the volunteers, so it, if you're afraid of court or anything like that, don't worry, we'll take care of that. So if I want to be a volunteer, um, it would involve me um, representing that vulnerable older citizen. Yes. 
in uh, situations that maybe they can't represent themselves. Right. We represent their best interests. When they go to court, they're also appointed an attorney to represent what they want. We represent their best interests, always considering, trying to get them what they want as much as possible. Okay. All right. What kind of volunteers? Tell me an average person that that usually is well um, suited for that. You know, do I have to be a lawyer? And no, no, no. <laughs> Typically, we took social. You know, initially, we took social workers or people with that kind of background. But we've really opened it up. Anyone that really cares or has a passion for it, for vulnerable adults, for helping vulnerable adults, I think you know you can do it. You have to be able to have time to go to court. So we do have a lot of volunteers who are retired or mm -hmm. have some flexibility in their job schedule so that they can can be there for court hearings. I um, asked um, Dr. Smith when we were in the break, Brian, about people taking financial advantage yeah. of older people. Um, sometimes you have to make a decision about whether or not you can or cannot continue to care for someone that maybe has been in your home. Usually there's some financial value attached mm -hmm. to that person and if they go to uh, a facility that money generally yes, follows absolutely. them. And so I see sometimes people opting to keep the older relative in the home mm -hmm. and not necessarily because I want to show you I love you so much right. but because they are attached to the money. Do you see that? Absolutely. We see that a lot and, and we tend to see that a lot when family members are very adamant about removing their loved one from the facility. Even though that loved one is perfectly fine there, they're happy, the quality of life is there, and all of a sudden this particular family member, a loved one, comes in and is very adamant about taking mom home. You have to look at that person's financial stability. Um, when you're a social worker and you're managing the care of a vulnerable population, you have a responsibility to assess the full situation. And so when there's changes in that person's bank account and their financial stability, if they no longer or have the financial support that they've always had. Something is wrong. That it's caregiver, absolutely you mean? Absolutely, the caregiver. Okay. And absolutely. they're looking for some money somewhere. Absolutely. You always have to look at what's, why is that person so eager? What is the benefit? You know, you have to do a full assessment. A lot of times when you ask a lot of questions, you tend to get the answers that you need and you want. But we have to take the time to ask those very, very tough questions. Mm -hmm. If not, then our vulnerable adults will leave a facility and go back into the arms of, of harm. And oftentimes, Brian, I'm thinking people may not mean to do harm, but sometimes inaction um, yep. leads to harmful situations. I mean, sure if can. someone can't walk and you insist on having them there, but you don't have the proper set up in the home for right. mobility and things like that. Absolutely. It can be very, very tough. You have Absolutely. to have the know-how mm -hmm. to, to understand how to deal with someone who, who needs assistance. Absolutely, uh -huh. and that's a very good point that you made. Whenever someone is discharged from mm -hmm. a facility, we have to do due diligence as a professional and do an assessment, a home assessment, to determine this person can in fact take care of this person. And if they can't, then you know you have to look for other resources and other support systems because that won't be due diligence for that individual to have them go home and they don't have the proper supports there. Yes, because in some of the situations that we have seen recently where we see that neglect resulted, you wonder if they were equipped to handle what they were trying to do in the first Absolutely. place. Absolutely. I'm a, a big proponent of education. If you don't have the foundational knowledge to provide quality care, then it's not going to work. And I'll tell you that at the Office for the Study of Aging, we do offer a free education program. It's called Dementia Dialogues. And it's a designed to provide basic education for family members and caregivers or any professional working with individuals living with dementia in their families. And it's free. It's supported by the South Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. A lot of times family members don't seek the education or the information. A lot of times they feel like they can't afford or they don't qualify for mm -hmm. resources, but you have to try. You can't wait for the information to come to you. You have mm -hmm. to go out and get it because we do have skilled people and programs available to provide staff and caregivers with the support they need in the education. Mm -hmm. Brenda, what about um, uh, children? Kids who are looking at their um, uh, aging family members and they're wondering, uh, will there be a time down the road when I'm going to need to do something? Uh, what would you say to a person that may be sitting there thinking that? That I may have some, I may have to take care of, of mm -hmm, my parent mm -hmm. down the road. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, yeah, contact the area agency on aging, SC Access, if there's dementia, the Alzheimer's Association, contact those groups. See if you can try put together a plan that you can Absolutely. take care of the person at home. Is, is it feasible? Because most people want to be at home. Or, so if you or can, in live independently. Or, or live independently, mm -hmm. yes. It, it, first, independently. Mm -hmm. Or live with the family member, mm -hmm. yes. Um, 
see if you can put a plan in place. Get, do everything you can to do that. If not, if, if you do end up needing a facility, there are resources out there where you can look and protection advocacy for people with disabilities, they have inspection reports of, commu of assisted living facilities on their website. Um, DHEC has inspection reports on their website. So there are resources that if you do end up needing a facility, you can look at and gain some information in advance. Well, yeah. this has been great information for it is. us. It is. Dr. Smith, we thank you. We thank, thank you both you. for thank being so uh, with you us. Much. What's your website? Our website, it's very, very long, <laughs> but <laughs> if you Google Office for the Study of Aging okay. or Google Dementia Dialogue, okay. the link will come up first. All right. All right. Dr. Macy Smith, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Brenda Stalzer, thank you so very you. much. Appreciate what you all do. When we come back, we're going to take a look at this upcoming event that we've been telling people about. It's the Statewide Black History Month program. Well, actually, it's the Black History Month parade and festival. But uh, Ovita Glover's back, and she's got some new things to announce. You guys right. stay tuned. From the Watchbox Studios, this is On Point on Watchbox with Cynthia Harding.